Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this press conference. Allow me to introduce the President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia, Evo Morales Aima. Well, thank you very much indeed to the international press. At the request of some of you, we've uh, come here to respond to some questions, doubts, uh, concerns that you have. And I'd like to tell you that I'm coming to the United Nations to participate in the beginning of the International Year of Quinoa. As we were explaining uh, earlier, the, the product is very important uh, for so many thousands of years. This was the case. Uh, but it was uh, hidden, it was uh, almost a condemned crop. And then at one point in time, the, the, an attempt was made to put an end to quinoa production. However, now after 7,000 years of the life that this important product has, that's so important for life, it's known by the United Nations. And how we provide an incentive for production to uh, how can we uh, incentivize production to fight against poverty quinoa is resistant to frosts it doesn't require much water for uh, its production and that is in stark contrast to a lot of other products that we have on the Bolivian uh, high plain um, such as in the Andes um, uh, maize, for example, potatoes, these uh, um, have uh, products that have enabled people to survive on the continent, as well as quinoa. And we'd like to thank the United Nations um, and, very many other, uh, and very many countries for supporting the declaration of the International Year of Quinoa. Uh, it helps us feel, we indigenous peoples, that we're not alone. The world um, knows our product and continues to consume it. But it's always good to have an opportunity to uh, explain what's happening. And uh, it's also been helping the economy for those that produce quinoa. Of course, uh, it's a combination in production, uh, uh, mixed livestock agricultural farming. And uh, three years ago, we had a meeting with the producers of quinoa. Um, and the governor um, uh, of La Paz is here with me on the visit to the United Nations uh, and uh, also the governor of uh, Potosi, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, is here with me and some governors from other areas that grow quinoa. Some wanted to be here but couldn't be here for work reasons. But certainly, um, in meetings that I've had with producers of quinoa, they, they say that it's very important to also uh, raise uh, 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 livestock so that you can have uh, natural manure to help grow quinoa. So quinoa isn't just a single product. It goes together with um, uh, the raising of uh, livestock in Bolivia. And more than ever, our brothers and sisters have begun to begin their, uh, uh, improve their uh, economy. And now, some um, some people of, uh, who are actually lawyers have left their uh, uh, jobs and are now producing quinoa. Um, some people involved in, tr in uh, the transport sector have left that sector to begin growing quinoa. Um, and uh, there have been some problems uh, of uh, uh, li 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 some want to produce more quinoa, others want to produce less in some areas of the Bolivian highlands and also in, in some of the valley areas. Um, we do like, we w wish to express our thanks to governors and uh, uh, governments that have uh, supported this uh, year, um, the International Year of Quinoa. We thank them very much. And uh, I'd now like to ask whether you have any questions. Yeah. 
Sí. El micrófono, por favor. Microphone, please. Yes. The, the, this, this person was the first person to ask for the floor, I think. Correspondence Association, we welcome you, Mr. President. And I'll ask the first question. Uh, the Secretary General pointed out today that. It's traditional. All right, I should start again. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondent Association, Mr. President, we welcome you. And as the first question, can you elaborate on what the Secretary General said this morning? He said prices are rising because quinoa is getting very popular and the poor risk being excluded in local markets. Can you explain that, how to prevent that? Well, just now when I spoke, um, I said that the quinoa seed and production have been growing, but also internally the production of quinoa has gone up in Bolivia. Bef before people were afraid to c consume quinoa, particularly in cities. And obviously, the price of quinoa has gone up because of the situation and, uh, and because internal consumption of uh, quinoa has gone up in Bolivia. Secondly, uh, perhaps in the east of uh, Bolivia, Bolivia, the um, indigenous people in the Amazon area, areas um, don't, have that, don't have that much access uh, 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 have access to quinoa, they've been growing it for years, but now the product is coming to the West. And, uh, and uh, it doesn't... Uh, uh, I've also heard some NGOs saying, unfortunately, that uh, with this declaration of the International Year of Quinoa, Quinoa is going to rise in price, uh, but we have to cover both the domestic and the international market. And fortunately, uh, experiments on quinoa production in uh, important countries have helped us to meet the demand, both uh, internally and externally. And I welcome the fact that there is interest in the world uh, in c consuming quinoa, but also in diversifying production. And there shouldn't be concerns about this because um, quinoa production is going up, but not everyone is going to uh, eat it. There's so many ways to share um, food uh, produce. Um, uh, there can be exchanges of uh, products, and that's uh, still the practice in very many areas of Bolivia, exchanges of uh, food. So I don't quite share this uh, view that quinoa's price is going up and therefore it's not going to be eaten any longer uh, by indigenous peoples. But uh, it's also true that when our, our product has a sure market, the indigenous people uh, then have to expand production, improve production. And my experience as a small-scale uh, producer is that when we have a certain market with a good price, then you don't need uh, credits or uh, um, loans or technical assistance. With your, your knowledge will help you to produce and expand that production because you're going to earn a good living and you have a sure market for the product. That's the vision of the small-scale uh, farmers. And I could tell you quite a lot of the work that uh, I did from my childhood 
right at, up until 1990 as a farmer. And uh, then I moved into the labor market and... and uh, Carmen Rodriguez Martin. There's a New York story about Bolivia. The prices have fallen, and thanks to your support and also the efforts of Sean Penn, Jacob Ursterweiser, who's now out of jail. And we'd like to know when this producer who is from New York will be able to return to New York and to his family here in New York. Answer by the president. Well, that there is a deep investigation being conducted by the justice system in Bolivia. There's suspicion, a suspicious amount of amount of money being made by a supposed rice producer. I don't want to comment on the case, but to date, it's difficult to understand. How is it possible that so many millions could be flowing, and where does the money come from? We're financing ladies with millions of dollars. All of this is quite suspicious, and I reiterate, this is in the hands of the judiciary in Bolivia. I am not a judge. It's not my place to judge or express an opinion, but based on the information we have, his comings and goings and his finances give way to a great deal of suspicion. Beginning of the question was not on microphone. You said that the large multinational companies have tried to prevent this from being declared the International Year of Quinoa. I'd like to know to what corporations are you referring? And do you think that the corporations have too much power in the United Nations in terms of water, climate change, and other issues? And if so, what can be done about it? Thank you. We have enormous differences with the capitalist system. Disagreement with regard to competitive policies. When there's competition, there will always be poverty and unfairness. Fortunately, some heads of state summits have been made to understand that complementarity policies are important in order to fight the multinationals and fight some of the different industries which are profitable. Our main difference is with the capitalist imperial system and the so-called developing or underdeveloped countries uh, which are being colonized through neoliberalism. And on other occasions, I've demonstrated that neoliberalism is not a solution for peoples, especially in Latin America. When we started to recover our own natural resources, only at that time, through nationalization of fossil fuels, did the Bolivian economy start to recover. That's just a single. The income before I was president was $100 million. Last year, it had gone to $4.2 billion in oil revenues. This is for a country of 10 to 11 million people. These economic resources enable us to meet the demands of the people. So imagine oil, multinational companies, mining companies with unfair trade, industries subsidized by the states, whether it's in fishing or agriculture. All of that does a great deal of damage, and that's why we are working on what we call complementary policies to complement those policies. An example would be the colleague from Argentina, Cristina, our neighboring country, Argentina, because there was sabotage from the United States and Canada to their wheat that was donated. So there was no incentive provided to growers of wheat. So we were actually eating 
North American bread. But with a policy of trying to bring about a change, they stopped all the donations. There was a lack of wheat, flour, and bread with the shortages. At that time, we talked about the situation with the president in Argentina and talked about the export commitments in terms of wheat to other countries. And we provided solidarity. They, it was not given. We were buying wheat. So we started buying wheat, and now wheat production has started improving. In other words, it's economic policies or fishing and agricultural policies which are very well designed in order to subjugate others to set conditions. And then, above and beyond that, when they feel like it, leave one without food or leave people without food. These are all multinational corporations that are being used as an instrument of capitalism, but always at the behest of the head of the government of the United States, not the people of the United States. When I came here in the first few times in 2006, 2007 to attend the ordinary meeting of the United Nations, we were very well received. So the peoples of America are fighting this kind of policy, which just leads to poverty and hunger. Fortunately, a number of various movements in Latin America and movements on other continents are very clear about the fact that deep-seated changes are needed. Social movements in Spain and some of the other European countries have set up an assembly and say that basic services should be a basic human right. And this is a human right in Bolivia. So basic services are in private hands. In our constitution, we view it as a human right, and therefore it cannot be in the private sector. And that, again, is something that enabled us to improve the economic situation in the country. And a million Bolivian men and women move from moderate poverty to the middle class through our economic policies. That's 1.3 million people were able to emerge from extreme poverty. This is in a country where there are more than 10 million people. Those are significant numbers and significant steps that we were able to take in a short amount of time through deep-seated change in the Bolivian economy. And this policy will continue. And for the first time of the history of our country since it was founded, we now have value added for our natural resources, especially fossil fuels. Separate to the, a plant from the liquid, a significant amount of investment has been put into this, some $500 million of investment. And so for the first time since the republic was founded, the investment is some $840 million for a petrochemical country. This is the first time this has ever been seen in Bolivia. Exploitation of raw materials has always been pillaging. And we see that just looking at the one area, which is the oil industry. From $300 million, the investment's gone to more than $400 million. E imagine the neoliberals, how much they stole from us, how much money they took away due to the imposition of the IMF, which is the economic arm and the economic instrument of the United States. They imposed economic policies and programs on our country using threats. And this whole process of the cultural democratic revolution is not just to free us socially and culturally, but it is also to free us from the economic and financial yoke. My friends, journalists, since 1940, Bolivia always had a fiscal deficit. The 1st of May 2006, we nationalized the oil industry. That was the very first step in our administration. And since that time, we have not had a deficit. In the past, governments were borrowing money to even pay the salaries of people. Now that has come to an end as well. 
we're not economists, and everybody thought we wouldn't be able to achieve the results. We didn't even imagine the kinds of results we could achieve by structural changes in the economy. But now it's understood using our own money, we're able to achieve this. And uh, there are a number of small programs in place in the reproduction area. This is some other information I wanted to provide. International reserves in 2005 were $1.7 billion. In January of this year, we went to $14 billion in international reserves. The deposits of the people were th $3 billion in 2005. Last year, we went to over $12 billion in deposits in the banks. These are people's deposits in the bank, in the private sector of banking. And we have the government bank. Before, loans were always for services and trade, not for the productive sector. Now, credit is extended from the private banking system up to 36% of annual interest. And we created our own bank for productive services with 6% annual interest charged. Before, it was a 30%. Now it's gone down to less than 2% on those loans. So the, we, the poor people, can pay our debts off, repay our loans. We, it was, we also had the same thing with hospitals that were private companies. They were subsidized. The private sector was helped along in this. The so-called entrepreneurs never paid back their debts, and the small producers pay back. And there's a huge economic movement in order to improve the national economy. In other words, policies imposed by the IMF did so much damage to Latin America. I don't know if at any point in time they should be brought to justice and investigated. I can't even say how much they've cost all of our countries. If we just look at the income generated by oil and we look at the in terms of international reserves, you get an inkling. Before, there's only a million Bolivian people had bank accounts. Now, 7 million Bolivians have bank accounts and deposit their money there and save their money there. We are saying it's no longer like the past where our brothers and sisters, the peasants, would keep the money under the pillow or under the bed. The situation economically and socially has changed in Bolivia. When I arrived to the presidency, only nine towns had telephones in the mayor's office. Now, hundreds of towns have telecommunications or mobile telephony. When I arrived in the capital city, not everyone had internet or 4G broadband. Now, 270 municipalities have internet service, not just La Paz, and 340 41 towns are connected. All of this based on what we've been able to achieve with the coca leaves. A French farmer said to me, come with me and see. I'd like to see what you do. We went a few kilometers. For me, he was not just a simple peasant or farmer. We traveled three or four hours. And this French brother farmer pressed a button on his car and they opened the garage with the remote control. From I didn't really know what that was. I was surprised. I had never seen that in Bolivia before, a garage that could be opened with a remote control. We went inside his house. He said, here's the shower, here's the phone, here's the air conditioning, the bed and so forth, with a phone in ra rural areas with light, electricity, showers, running water, all of this in the farm. This was completely different from what I had experienced. We didn't have running water or electricity without even talking about cars and telephones. What kind of a farmer is this? For me, it was like another world. What world is this that I've come to, where farmers have their own cars, their own drinking water, showers, telephones? 
And at that point in time, I said, when are we going to have that in Bolivia? And in a very short period of time, we're getting there. We've already started. I myself am very surprised at the changes that we've accomplished. But you were asking about the transnational companies. As we've always said, companies, if you want to be partners with us, you're welcome. But you cannot be the bosses or here to pillage our natural resources. And that's why I once again recommend to other countries, especially in Africa, where there are multinational or transnationals who are there pillaging and exploiting their natural resources and fossil fuels, get your natural resources back, recover, and you need to have sovereignty over your own national resources. And that will change your national economy. That was Bolivia's experience. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Excellency. I'm from Voice of America for Latin America. We'd like to, uh, we're hearing you talk about multinationals right now. On Monday, your government um, uh, nationalized SABSA in Bolivia um, and the company that operates the three airports, Cochabamba, La Paz, and Santa Cruz. I'd like to know what you can tell us about this. Uh, because people are concerned about the situation. And the second part of my question is a lot of uh, people are um, concerned about uh, President Chavez. We know that you're, you're a great friend of his. Uh, could you tell us uh, a little uh, about that situation? Do you have any information? Thank you very much. <laughs> That's what... That's what I wanted, the question I wanted to hear, and I think I was uh, indirectly replying to it in the previous uh, answer. Uh, well... In 1997, um, uh, the, there was a privatization. It was called a capitalization, actually, a privatization. And uh, one share was 10, uh, was 10 Bolivar dollars. That's more or less a dollar and a half US per share. That was the purchase price. And they uh, invested uh, 26 million um, Bolivars. More than f less than less than four thousand uh, dollars. That was the investment they put in the three national airports, and the value of those uh, three airports is four hundred and thirty million dollars. So imagine how, with four thousand dollars, they were able to buy three uh, airports uh, that were valued at four hundred and thirty million dollars. And since. Uh, up until 2005, there was no investment plan. They just took out money. They were, it was just harvesting money. And since from 2000, uh, between 2006 and 2025, I think, they committed to invest $26 million. And by 2011, they were to have invested 16 million, and apparently only 5 million has been invested. So there had been no investment at all, more or less. That was just maintenance, and maintenance is not the same as investment. I mean, we might have differences of interpretation there from a legal point of view, but the worst of all is that the man manager of this uh, com company uh, uh, aimed, uh, earned uh, 18,000 US dollars a month. That's what I earn in nine months. He earned in one month without any investment being uh, made. So I'd like to tell you that uh, three years ago we started preparing for the nationalization and the former president, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero of Spain, uh, told me here at the UN in New York that he would guarantee that the company would invest. Unfortunately, in the dialogue that we've had with our company, all we've done is lose uh, over three years. And it should have been nationalized three years ago, in fact. And now, now we're seeing that the airport terminals are very small 
And since we have an, an economic uh, upswing, uh, a lot of people want to travel, but the airports are too small because there hasn't been investment in the airport terminals. So we were obliged to nationalize, and of course now we're going to invest in them. That's just one example of how companies operate, but the companies that are partners like Repsol from Spain, they are excellent partners. They invest, we work together very well. If companies invest, let me tell you that the investment is guaranteed and you can also uh, recover um, your investment. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, total Repsol, Petrobras uh, from Brazil. But, but some, some um, companies, and I'd like to say to, to Spain and the Spanish people, that perhaps because of some bad apples, some bad companies, there are some diplomatic differences that we're experiencing. But it's not the fault of the Spanish government, and it's not the fault of the Spanish people. It's the fault of some companies who just come to Bolivia to rob the country, take money home, without investing to improve our airports. They, so they, as I said, they, they, their um, CEO was huge, earning these huge uh, sums with uh, no investment, and uh, all parties uh, uh, have been this in Spain uh, have been supporting this nationalisation, and elect uh, and we also uh, nationalised Electropass in uh, December. Now in the city. Uh, it was 60 cents per kilowatt hour, and in the uh, c uh, country, uh, uh, it should have been cheaper. How is it possible, however, that that wasn't the case, and m my um, brothers and sisters were having to pay more? Um, we negotiated to try and get one single price, but we had to force that decision through. And next month, next month. Uh, brothers uh, in rural areas, indigenous peoples, for per kilowatt hour will pay 0.60 uh, cents. So these are social policies that we have to implement in order to improve the social and economic situation, particularly for those that have been most abandoned. On uh, President Chavez. Well, again, let me say uh, how much respect and admiration I have for both Fidel and Hugo. In the first and second years of my administration, 2006-2007, uh, their help with social policy, the uh, miracle vision, uh, support for our productive sector, uh, support for small-scale projects from Venezuela was so important for consolidating the change uh, in Bolivia and it really does um, pain me that um, that uh, Fidel Castro is no longer president and uh, particularly as well now that uh, my brother President Chavez is in a very difficult spot with his health and I remember both of them told me, Evo, you have to look after yourself. You have to rest. And now, and, and they were telling me to rest, and uh, and I didn't. Uh, I wasn't listening to them. And now, I do see that uh, they weren't uh, resting either. And we've been uh, speaking with uh, the the doctors. He, they tell us he's resting. He's still under treatment. We've spoken with the family. Uh, the family is uh, strengthened, of course. So the fact that uh, President Chavez is back in uh, Venezuela is strengthening them all. Uh, the day before yesterday, I w went to an intercultural uh, farmers' uh, event, and all of the leaders that spoke there. Uh, uh, I I expressed uh, their thanks for this organization, but above all, they said, well, fortunately, our brother Chavez is back in uh, Venezuela. Our brother Rafael Correa has been re-elected in Ecuador. When presidents uh, are part of historic century 
uh, once in a century uh, changes, people recognize this work of presidents and commanders in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I hope that President Chavez will soon once again be at the helm of uh, the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, uh, as always serving his people. Particularly in the Syrian crisis and in the Iran nuclear, with the Iranian nuclear program problems with America. How, does you, how do you view those crises and what advice do you have from your example in Latin America that you may pass on to the people of the Middle East? Mm. Well, first, some powers have no authority nor ethics, nor moral authority as presidents to speak about nuclear weapons. Secondly, conflicts, conflicts within countries is provoked by capitalism and then they intervene militarily. A good example is Libya and Gaddafi. It was the Libyan oil for some powers. I should say I was in a meeting with heads of state in Europe and I was asking one of the presidents, well now who's in charge of Libyan oil? And the president said, no, don't ask me, ask the other president, another European president. So with the pretext of social conflict, uh, nuclear weapons, drug trafficking, or weapons of mass destruction for humanity. These are all pretexts to intervene and take over the natural resources in that country. We understand exactly what's going on. Anti-capitalist governments and anti-imperialist governments are accused of being drug trafficking and fomenting internal conflict and then of course you need an intervention. But ultimately it's not social it's really about natural resources, not social conflict. That's why Bolivia does not believe in war or interventions, nor does it want to discuss that in the United Nations, if there's a democracy or no democracy in the United Nations. It's not possible that all the countries of the United Nations would be subject to the Security Council. What Security Council? It's an insecurity council for mankind around the world. That would be another discussion. So. Well, as peoples, we need to avoid any social conflict. That's not the issue. Without social conflict, there would be no reason for intervening. There are groups where uh, conflict is fostered by the government of the United States. They create conflict, as they have tried to do in Bolivia and other places, and then justify a coup d'etat, as they've done in Latin America as well. In Bolivia, after approving the new constitution, we have become a peaceful country, pacifist. We don't provoke anyone, but everyone should also uh, be prepared if there's any kind of territorial aggression against us. I come from the culture of life, not from the culture of death. I do not share policies or actions around death as being planned by the Security Council. And there we have huge differences of opinion as a president, as a government, and as a country within the United Nations. Once again, that will be an ongoing discussion in order to demo make the United Nations more democratic. Another example is the economic blockade against Cuba, the embargo. Two or three countries rejected. All countries in the world support Cuba. So why does the United Nations not make the resolutions be complied with? Israel and the United States reject, and then all the rest of the countries in the world are subject to the will of the United States and Israel. What democracy? And we could give many other examples of what happens in the world like that. What about relations between Chile and Bolivia right now? Like the example of the soldiers who were taken prisoner and also the passage to the sea. I think 
you very much for talking about soldiers such as CNN and not talk about CNN talking about officials. They were drafted into the military and they are serving the military because it's compulsory. They were used to fight against smugglers. They were chasing smugglers. I think that there's a political purpose to them being detained. For I think for the first time in history in Bolivia, or of the two countries, like Chile and Bolivia, we've said it truthfully. We've said it using historical arguments. We've used legal arguments. And above and beyond that, we've said it to their face, in their homes, and in front of 60 countries. We've talked about the situation of the passage to the sea for Bolivia. And it bothered them. It bothered the government of Chile. And now they have taken revenge with three soldiers. I think it's lacking in humility, not because of the people of Chile, but the government and the president. Our soldiers are now heroes and defenders of the sea. It's not because the president and the authorities have an issue with us about the whole passage to the sea issue that they should then arrest our soldiers. This is tension between governments and presidents, but there are peoples. Fortunately, there are people in Chile who support our sovereign claim to the passage to the sea. I should say here there are enormous contradictions in the President Piñera's policies. First, he says that the Treaty of 1904 is untouchable and cannot be reviewed or changed. And then he says that the Treaty of 1904 could be enhanced. Then he says, we can't touch upon the subject of sovereignty with regard to the passage to the sea. And then he says, for economic reasons, we could talk about sovereignty. What's most important is money. And then, of course, you can talk about sovereignty. He doesn't say it's just a bilateral issue. He says then later, if the Hague rules in favor of Peru, then Bolivia won't have a sea. So he's now multilateral, making the issue a multilateral issue, not just bilateral. I don't know why. But it's all written down in the communications. And it's been filmed and recorded by the media. We're not inventing this. He says to us, there's nothing pending. Chile, Bolivia, there's nothing pending between them. Now imagine that. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States says there's a pending issue here and we need to resolve it. Yesterday or the day before yesterday, we were informed with a great deal of satisfaction about what was said by Isabel Allende, that there is a pending issue, that treaties can be modified, and that the Bolivia-Chile passage of the sea issue needs to be resolved. These are well-known people, social movements in Chile that support our claim. If the sea issue is resolved and Bolivia regains its sovereign passage to the sea, then we can work together with the Chilean people and government in a complementary fashion. We can share the very little that we have in order to improve the well-being of our peoples. Some countries, some presidents, some parties are not interested in the economic welfare of their peoples. What interests uh, them is international business and the business whims of multinationals. Now, now let's not confuse matters here. I'm convinced that if one is involved in politics, it's to serve the people. And policies and politics is not about business, it's not about profits. It's making an effort, it's sacrificing and making a commitment to our peoples. In other words, service to our peoples. And again, that is something that we are changing. I should just mention in passing that when we started building this political movement in 1993, 94, 95, when we started talking about this as a political instrument for the sovereignty of Bolivia, at that time, 
I had a lot of doubts about being a politician because a politician is seen as a criminal, as someone who is evil or somebody who has evil agendas, usually associated with criminals. It cost a lot for me to understand that it was really about service. And now we are implementing that idea with policies of austerity, of honesty, the idea that not everyone is equal. Not everyone who supports us thinks the same way. We still have decolonization that needs to take place. What do you say when you have one party that wins and it's, okay, now it's our turn when that party wins? It's, we've inherited a, a colonial state and inherited neoliberal mindsets, and that needs to be changed. That's what we mean by decolonizing our country, is changing the mindset. Unfortunately, some politicians and businessmen mix up the country with business. Some politicians and businessmen use the country for the purposes of making profits and not for social improvement. And that, again, is another ongoing discussion. And once again, I should say that I have some authority and ethics to question those policies that use the country for making money on supposedly on behalf of the people. Thank you very much. Uh, now, you just uh, said to response to the Syria question that Bolivia was uh, not for the politics of blood. Uh, now, the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Commission says that more than uh, 70,000 people have been killed in Syria. What's your message to the fighting sides? What's your message to the government, which the UN blames? And also, I have, I have another question about uh, the US ad uh, Obama administration. Now, all of your successes, I mean, do, do they have a, an open channel with you? Do they change their mentality at all, or they, are they the same? Thank you. I say to the Syrian people they should lay down their arms, resume their lives, and serve their countries. Their country. We have a very different view from President Obama. And unfortunately, indirectly, he's financing the conspiracy. But not so much as when I was ambassador. The C CIA is involved in this. They promote social conflict when they're against capitalism and imperialism. There's always conspiracy against them then, any country that tries to do that. That's all I can say. Without the United States, we're better off. With our little experience and the information we have, developed countries known as powers will never allow countries to develop and improve their situations. The poor people are, the more subjugated they are. And it's desirable to have nations in that situation, but it's not a good idea to be attached to the United States. A number of former politicians of uh, dictatorships have said where there's an embassy in the United States, there's always a military dictatorship and a coup d'etat. There are no coup d'etats in the United States because there's no U.S. ambassador in the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I just wonder at the end if you can tell us, excuse me, if you can tell us what is your view whether the United Nations with all its programs and the world actually will be able to eradicate the, uh, the poverty by the years as it was planned 2015. Thank you. Pueden erradicar la pobreza como estaba planificado para el año 2015. Se refiere a los eh, objetivos de desarrollo del 
how can you have for almost an illegal concentration of capital in the hands of a few without taking account of the poverty of the majority in the world? So to say that we're going to eradicate poverty with capitalist policies is a great mistake, not just for some countries, but for humanity as a whole. Thank you, Mr. President. And, um, I'd like to go back to um, your visit to Caracas yesterday. And um, I wanted to clarify whether or not you saw President Chavez. Um, we all, we've We've all been told that he um, isn't able to speak at the moment because he has a tube in his trachea. And I wondered whether you, as one of his close friends, felt that this put an extra burden on you and on uh, President Correa of Ecuador to sort of speak out even more forcefully for the kinds of issues that the three of you believe in. But I wonder if especially you could clarify on, on your visit to Caracas and, and whether you did try and see him and whether you were able to see him. Well, I said just now that uh, it was difficult uh, uh, to uh, get to see him. We spoke with his doctors, with his family, but you must understand that uh, he's gone through the most difficult uh, moments in his life. So many prayers, uh, Catholic Church, uh, Evangelical Church, other religions have prayed for him, and uh, clearly this has not been in vain. There are days that where the situation uh, of his health is very difficult, uh, according to the information from his ministers. But now uh, he's returned to Caracas, and that's a great relief. And of course, I said, uh, as I said just now, I wasn't able to meet him. I only was able to meet with the head doctor and with his family. But uh, my understanding is that he's very encouraged. That they are very encouraged. Uh, but sometimes uh, diseases, illnesses are difficult to fight. And of course, we hope that we'll be together soon um, to be able to continue working together as we have done up until now. On the other subject. Whether, um, well, country, uh, and, uh, other uh, uh, countries that have uh, anti-imperialist systems uh, all speak the same language. We are uh, sure that these policies imposed from above have never been a solution. This is also what President uh, Correa is saying. He's also a great uh, economist and he wor he's working with his people and you can see the results. This is good uh, government uh, management and, uh, and, and hopefully we'll be able to free all peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much.